good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome back. This is my sixth year uh, in this beautiful colonnade, breezy colonnade, the store of Atalos. And it's always a great pleasure to be here. I think the word stoa uh, is linked to the word stoicism. And God knows we need a fair amount of that forgotten quality these days. Um, democracy is engagement, it's community, um, it's the capacity for civilized disagreement. And I think all of you, and I see many familiar faces, uh, all of you testify to that spirit uh, by being part of this um, remarkable Athens Democracy Forum. Uh, I've just seen, been to visit for the second time, uh, the oldest, said to be the oldest ballot box, at least the oldest secret ballot box. So uh, if you're angry about gerrymandering and hanging chads and Citizens United and all the rest, uh, this is your ground zero. Uh, our theme tonight is um, democracy in danger. Um, I'm not sure if democracy is in danger, in evolution, in transformation, uh, in decline. But I am pretty sure that things are going to get worse uh, before they get better. In other words, that the nativist, nationalist, xenophobic tide is still far from its zenith. Um, more long term, so in the short term, I'm fairly pessimistic. Longer term, I do believe that the values of freedom and the rule of law will prevail in the 21st century. I can't imagine the horror of a 21st century without them. So to steer us uh, through uh, all this, I'm joined tonight by Monique Villa, who is um, the CEO um, of Thomson Reuters Foundation, by Kishore Malbani, who's a professor at the National University of Singapore, and by Carolina Vigora, uh, the editor of Kultura Liberalna in Warsaw, Poland, a country that knows what illiberalism uh, is all about. Uh, Monique, I'd like to start with you, and I'd like to start with some fairly recent news. I mean, after Nelson Mandela, I think the personality that the West uh, built into um, the most charismatic democratic icon was probably Aung San Suu Kyi uh, in Burma. Uh, you work with Reuters. Um, she recently, um, uh, having failed to condemn the expulsion of several hundred thousand Rohingya uh, from Burma, uh, she has now uh, declined to condemn the sentencing to seven years in prison of two Reuters journalists uh, who were doing their jobs, trying to find out what had happened uh, in a particular village uh, with the expulsion of the Rohingya. So, uh, did we get it all wrong? Uh, was Aung San Suu Kyi just a Burmese nationalist uh, all along? And what does that say about Western naivete uh, when it um, comes to judging uh, who is a real democrat in another part of the world, that's to say Asia? Well, you have to recognize that Aung San Suu Kyi was uh, very silent because she could not speak, she could not write, she was not published. So, so we, 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 we made this idol and, and uh, uh, for the free world, and maybe we were wrong indeed. And it's particularly shocking that uh, she has not said a word of the sev on the 700 southern Rohingyas who, who were forced to leave their country and, and many, many of them killed, and it's a pure genocide in some cases. The two Reuters journalists were journalists who were just trying to prove that in a village, 10 men were ex executed, summary executed. Uh, because they were Rohingyas, and, and they, they came with all the proofs before publishing it. They were arrested before they could publish, mm -hmm. and we published after, and all the press in the world, I mean, most of the press in the world published then the report that we, we put out. 
So yes, Oson Shuki, an idol that has fallen, uh, it, it, it's, it's dramatic. Do you think she never really was? I don't know. I mean, after all, it was journalists, brave journalists, who went to see her under her longhouse arrest and got, her, got the yeah. word out. So um, was she never a Democrat? Really? You, she was the daughter of a great man. And, and, a, uh, and a general. <laughs> and, a, and a general. Mm -hmm. And we, d we don't know. Mm -hmm. we, we, I mean, who would I be to judge her? I can't. Uh, she has lived a terrible experience also. But yeah. the fact that she's silenced and she's doing apparently nothing mm -hmm. to help democracy in, in Myanmar is horrendous. Akisha, you're, you're from Singapore. Uh, which is um, a somewhat uh, autonomous, uh, so autocratic, sorry, uh, state. Yeah. Um, and um, you've expressed some um, skepticism about uh, the West and the West's uh, future. Um, do, you, do you think that the West is naive in having a kind of checklist of what's important to democracy, for example, the freedom of the press, uh, not so much the case in Singapore, uh, and that we should look at other successful models like Singapore's and just say they're just as valid. Uh, well, let me begin with the good news. Yeah. <laughs> I, there's so much doom and gloom with this conference that I got to introduce. No, we're happy to be in Greece. <laughs> let, me, let me give you some data, okay? okay. Mark, you spoke about the democratic recession. If you did a statistical count of the number of human beings on planet Earth that are now living in democracies, it's probably the largest it's ever been in human history. If you include 1.3 billion people in India, 250, 440 million people in Indonesia, which is an amazingly successful democracy, you include 140 million in Bangladesh, and then you look at what's happened in Malaysia in the last elections. Mahathir came back in 92. And then if you look at the smallest country in the world, Bhutan, and how they've had a transition from monarchy to democracy, there are a lot of successful stories in democracy all around the world, which I think are being ignored in this debate. So I think if you take a larger global focus, and especially if you factor in Indonesia, uh, Asia, the Asian, dimension, I would say that the, in, uh, in there's absolutely no doubt that, as you said, as we move towards the 21st century, more and more countries will become democratic because there are more and more models of successful democracies. I, for example, I can tell you, since I lived through the 97, 98 financial crisis in Indonesia, we all thought in Southeast Asia that Indonesia would become the next Yugoslavia. In fact, it's a far more divided nation than yeah. Yugoslavia is. Instead of becoming Yugoslavia, it's ended up as the world's most successful Islamic democracy. So I would say, in answer to your specific question, do, are, are the Asians trying to provide an alternative model? The answer is no. And Singapore, just for the record. The Asians are not trying to, to uh, suggest an alternative model? No. How can you say that? Xi Jinping at the 19th Communist Congress said for the first time, absolutely specifically, yeah. that China is offering a new model to the world for countries that want to remain independent and progress. It was the first time that China had explicitly, and that's why I was struck by what you said this morning as well. Okay. How can you say that? Okay. I think it's important to look at the context in which the statements are made. Do you agree he said it? Yeah, he said it, but what he meant by that statement is that he was not projecting China as an alternative political model. He was not? He was not, but he was promoting China's economic development and saying if you look at China's economy and how it has grown, it suggests there are other ways to grow your economy too. Yeah. But I, I can assure you that you know, if you have to go back to 5,000 years of Chinese history, to, to, to understand that they don't have the kind of proselytizing instinct that the West does. They don't have it. And if they had it 500 years ago when Admiral Cheng He, with a much larger armada, with much bigger ships than the Portuguese had, when he traveled all the way from China to Africa, should have created a string of Chinese colonies 500 years ago. He's not suggesting that a society that is not democratic 
where there is no free press, mm -hmm. where there is considerable censorship of the internet, and so on and so on, is, and I'm not disputing Chinese success over recent decades, yeah. uh, it seems to me, he said very explicitly, that model, which is not a Western democratic model, is now available to, perhaps not to the West, but certainly to the 88% you keep yeah. referring to, yeah. all the people in developing nations who are looking for a way forward. Well, I, I, can, I can tell you exactly what the 88% heard, yeah. because we know that the Chinese Communist Party, unlike the Soviet Communist Party, is not trying to set up uh, as you know, Communist International, it is not exporting Communist parties anywhere. In fact, for your information, uh, for the record, China used to support Communist parties in several Southeast Asian countries and shut them down. So they understand that their system is unique to them. And, and they certainly don't believe that the Chinese system is exportable also because, frankly, and I suspect they would say this in their hearts of hearts, that you have to be Chinese. <laughs> To, to work in this uh, uh, system. And there's a, there's a different kind of political compact between the Chinese people and Chinese rulers that goes back a long way, which is not replicable uh, in other societies. It's certainly not replicable yeah. even in Singapore. Yes, but we were all in, uh, some of us were in Davos hmm. when uh, he presented this alternative model. It was just, it was not, uh, it was not, you know, by chance that he mm. did uh, this speech in Davos. It was just after the election of Donald Trump, mm. and he presented as, as the, the, the mm. future leader of not the free world, but indeed a model that mm. could be adapted to many others. A mm. And we heard it. No, I, yeah. I was I was in Davos like too. To, and like the speech, to the speech like that, to bring in just a quick, quick point, yeah. a factual point. The speech that Roger was referring to was not given in Davos. No, but he repeated, uh, I mean, it was, no, in, Davos, in Davos, he was talking about yeah. globalization. Yeah. I mean, you didn't hear what we heard, which is a little strange. No, 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 I, no, to be fair, to be fair, Roger, I <laughs> heard anyway, exactly, let's, let's leave that now. but I, I think it's important, it's important for you, yeah. I have to emphasize this, you have a Western lens of looking at the world, and you have a non-Western lens of looking at the world, and that's all I'm saying. Yeah. Well, and, and all I want to share with you is a non-Western lens. Yeah. You can agree, you can disagree, mm -hmm. but it's there, it's a reality. Caroline, let me, let me bring you in. You, you live in Warsaw. Uh, I went to Poland a fair amount right after the fall of the Berlin Wall, and there was no country on earth that was more enamored of freedom, of the West, or more convinced that it had to get into NATO, that it had to get into the European Union. I remember several conversations with Adam Mishnik where he just said, we want normality, and normality for us can only be assured by the West. And we are part of the West. We were unjustly separated from it, and now we're coming back. And now, um, you know, however many years on it is, um, uh, Kaczynski uh, and his p political party have, have really turned on the West and are holding it up as a model of decadence, really, and uh, saying, why should we you know, have all these immigrants? Look at the problems they cause in France and elsewhere, and really, borrowing from Viktor Orban's template in Hungary, uh, is proposing again, another model, again, uh, an illiberal model. Um, this illiberal model, do you think it, it has legs? I mean, is this the future of a big part of Europe? Um, are we naive to believe that liberal democratic models will, will prevail? Mm. Well, thank you very much uh, and, for and this question. And could you also explain this extraordinary turnabout? Yes, of course. Thank it's you. very logical. Yeah. Logical? It's very logical. Oh, okay. So let me just say two things. First about Poland, and the other one will be about liberal democracy as such. First is about Poland after 1989. You must imagine a country that was full of imagination of a certain mythos of the West. The West was perceived by the Eastern Europeans, not only Poles, not only as an economical better world, but also as a better world from the moral point of view. So we imagined that we have all to immigrate. We had to all emigrate to the West. And we did. And we behaved as the first generation of immigrants. Very precisely, <laughs> fulfilling. Best behavior the best behavior we imagined. But the second generation came, and the second generation of immigrants, as you know, 
is always very critical towards the place their parents chose or were brought to. And this is what happens with Poland right now. So this is us for your question about the West uh, and Poland. And now I think there is also another angle to this. It has been wisely said today that um, for many decades, the way towards liberal democracy seemed irreversible in the West. But why? Why was it so irreversible? I think it's about passions. I think um, not only Poland, but also the Western world was escaping from a certain kind of fear. And this fear is called the Second World War, basically. Even if the US didn't go through the Second World War, it still became the trauma for the whole Western culture. With generations, with time, this fear of the past evaporated and it was this, th there was a certain shift from this fear of the past to the fear of the future. And the fear of the future has many faces. It has the face of problems with the labor market. It has the face of what are going, what our children are going to do and where are they going to work. But also it has a face of a Syrian refugee. And this is basically a shift in passions that we all share. We were also in Poland once escaping from our past, fearing the past, but now we basically fear the future. And the fear of the future is the passion that is best embraced by the populists. And before we embrace this shift, I think we cannot explain what is happening to us as the Western culture, because I understood you have been saying about the gloomy atmosphere, and you have been saying about the Eastern lands, and then I thought, yes, we are not talking about the condition of democracy here globally, we're talking about a crisis of a certain Western model. Mm -hmm. It's curious, though, because in both Hungary and Poland, um, they're very homogeneous societies. You, I mean, there are some Ukrainian immigrants, but you, I can hardly see you there. But yes, I, I think yeah. you're out there somewhere. <laughs> uh, um, can I put can I my hand up? <laughs> I will have the sun on uh, your eyes, yeah. <laughs> uh, so it's really the specter, that's okay, thank you. Teacher. It's really the specter of the of the unknown. I mean, how, how have Orban and Gaczynski dr drummed up this much fear about a presence that is not present? Hmm. Of course, we are fearing ghosts in Poland. There are no Syrian refugees. Fearing ghosts, yeah. Of course, we are fearing ghosts. But this is something um, about populism too. It's very much about Kaczynski and Orban, and it's very much about populism as such. We rarely understand that populism is actually the latest invention of infotainment. Mm -hmm. So it is not only that those images of the refugees jumping on fences and giving the babies, holding the babies up, they're not only um, deeply disturbing from the moral point of view, but also I believe for a large part of society, these are images that bring a certain kind of entertainment and this is why um, the opposition in Poland, for example, has such tremendous difficulties with reacting because they are being, um, they, they, they are being made to react to all those strong images and, 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 and sentences and, and theses that are being uttered and also very vulgar language. Like, for example, I've been um, searching on internet today and I found a quotation from a certain um, uh, representative of the law and justice government who said, who was, who was boasting of um, um, with, with, uh, with our homogeneity to his Swedish uh, colleagues and he said, why don't you Swedes just behave like the Vikings and just put, put, uh, um, send away all those like refugees? Like, like the Vikings, yeah, yeah, yes. sorry. So, so um, this is again a question for us. Mm -hmm. If this is partly about entertainment, can the liberal Democrats be more entertaining than the populists? And if so... You're saying liberal Democrats are boring? Yes, I'm saying so. 
too boring. They are extremely boring in my country, and as far as I Maybe observe the public your debate country. in your country, in France, in Germany, I believe, um, perhaps not Macron, but um, this is another discussion. Um, because you are not in France. <laughs> <laughs> I'm almost in France with, you know, you know there are no, there are no um, um, borders now with the new technologies and so on, so I'm basically observing the public debate there directly. But um, the next question, of course, comes after we decide whether or not liberal democrats can be entertaining. The question is whether we can be entertaining without losing our identity I, 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 and so values. Let's, yeah, let's bring I, it, I mean, is, is Emmanuel Macron entertaining? And how do you see the whole well, well, Macron-Trump, um, whatever well, it is at know, this point? Well, this is anecdotal. I think yeah. that we, we but, Macron is But is they represent two different ideas. Yeah, Ma Macron is certainly entertaining because he's new and, and he, br he brought such a breath of fresh air yeah. in France where yeah. we were feeling so old and so past and so... Yeah finished, so suddenly a young guy <laughs> arrived from nowhere, he's brilliant, we vote for him, which was good enough, and, and, and so, yes. Uh, but I think that fundamentally, uh, it's not the question of entertainment, it's really a question of media and democracy. So media is the pillar of democracy, this is for sure. If not, why Putin would put billions of dollars in creating Russia today, and Sputnik just to, to, mm -hmm. to spread um, a, a view of the world which is not the view that uh, we, we, we would defend uh, and, and create uh, news that are not real news. So I think it's, it's a real pillar. So I think reducing it to entertainment is, is really a, a, a bit too much. All I do at the Thompson Reuters Foundation is to try to promote democracy and the rule of law through good journalism, as you do at the New York Times, etc. But at the New York Times, you are more opinionated because you have chose your you have chosen your camp. How which do you is get fine. funding to do that? Because you're to, to, an independent foundation. Yeah. yeah, get the funding is not easy. It's never easy to fundraise. But uh, we have a model that has allowed uh, you know a media network to give me uh, millions of dollars to cover uh, issues like uh, totally unreported issues like access to land, access to property, etc., or a CNA foundation that uh, gave me funding to report on slavery and trafficking all over the world. So we are distributed by Reuters Wise. So we bring to all broadcasters uh, and, and media operations around the world news that usually people don't cover. So you shed light on issues and you provoke, I'm sorry, you can provoke democracy with it. Because when you shed light on corruption in Africa, you know that 40 to 60 billion dollars disappear every year in the hands of corrupted people in Africa. If you, if you shed light on that, you provoke the reaction of the government. You, 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 you keep, I mean, you have to Do you keep, feel you're rowing against the tide and trying yes, to... Yes, completely, yeah. but in the same time, yeah. by, by doing what we do, or, you know, and, and then we speak of the US, but I've been a witness in the US. The, 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 the television networks have really helped Trump to be elected, really, because he was entertainment, that's the world again, so he was, all, he was doing audiences, so you had all the television channels showing Trump much more than uh, Hillary. But then, the media have reacted in a fantastic way, I mean, be it the New York Times, the Washington Post, all the others, so it's a sign of a real democracy. The judiciary in the U.S. Has, in, has been incredibly strong in standing up to, to Trump, and this is also the sign of a, uh, of a democracy. So I don't know if, to come back to Asia, and you're right, the future is in Asia. We know it. Absolutely, the Do numbers are there. Do we agree on there. that? Yeah. yeah. We agree on that? On this panel? <laughs> I mean, you all agree that, I mean, is this... Well, she, she agreed to me. <laughs> no, no, but I you, say, you no, argue, no, no, I don't agree. You argue for the decline of the West, Do you, Kishan? No, well, no, no I, I would say the, the relative, the relative share that the West has of the global economy, uh, of the global, what I would call even the global mind in terms of the capturing the airwaves and so on and so forth, uh, that's going to shrink. And, and one confident prediction I'm going to make is that what's going to be difficult for the West to accept is that the chemistry of the globe is going to change in a very, very yeah. fundamental way because you've had rather... 200-year period 
of unusual Western domination. I always emphasize from the year one to the year 1820, the two largest economies of the world were always those of China and India. So it's only in the last 200 years that Europe took off and America took off. The last 200 years have been an aberration. All aberrations come to a natural end. And in, by the way, already today in purchasing- We, we haven't lived it as an aberration. Uh, <laughs> I, I would say, yes, you haven't lived it, but I think it's important to understand that the world that is coming tomorrow, and by the way, I want to emphasize this. I mean, so the it's, United it's, States has underwritten global security since 1945. It, it's, and, yes, and, it has, yes, it and has. until and, the current and, president and, and, arrived, and, and it, it's uh, the been, institutions it's, we underwrote were seen as, as foundations of the spread of freedom. And uh, oh, I, I think it's more importantly, you created a liberal international order, which was a gift to the world, and which the world still appreciates, by the way. As you notice that the whole world wants the WTO to continue, and the only country that's now opposed to WTO is Donald Trump, as you know. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yes, many of the Western gifts that were gifts to the world will continue, but in these same organizations, the chemistry is going to change. For example, I mean, you still have a rule that says to become the head of the IMF, you must be a European. To become the head of the World Bank, you must be American. But you have created the, the Chinese have created the... the, the no, 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 I know, I know. But I mean, ask you, I mean, if you, on a value scale, if you yeah. have freedom here and rapid economic growth hmm. of the kind both Singapore and China have had for a long time, uh, if you have freedom on one side, freedom as we understand it, and rapid economic progress, which is more important to you? Well, I think both. And That's uh, not an answer. No, no. <laughs> I mean, look, you know, it's funny, you, 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 it's important to understand the complexity of Asia, because in India has had rapid economic growth and has freedom. In Indonesia, by the way, just for your information, has been growing over 5% now for over 20 years with freedom. Bangladesh has been growing at 5 Could I question on India? So India. I, think, I think don't make it black and white, if you don't it's mind. It's not black and make white. It, make but make it a money colored, uh, uh, a many colored canvas and understand that each color has a different meaning. Uh, on India, which is a country where I spend a lot of time every year, and uh, it's, it's indeed a democracy. Hmm. And they vote, hmm. uh, and uh, and it is a democracy. But you have half of the population, which are the women, hmm. which are treated as second zone citizens. So the day where India will be a real democracy hmm. is the day they recognize that women hmm. can have the same opportunity as men. As long as they don't recognize it first, yeah. they will not develop as much as the Chinese do. And second, you yeah. cannot say it's a real vibrant, hmm. Total democracy. Yeah. Carolina, do you think the 21st century? Can I just quickly respond on India, if you don't mind, just very quickly? I should mention I'm ethnically Indian. <laughs> and the, the, the opening up and liberalization of Indian society is off the charts. If you look at how the untouchables have now joined the modern yeah. economy, yeah. that's remarkable. There's a wonderful new book that's out by a CNN correspondent. Monique was speaking about women. No, 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 women, women, women. Yeah, but yeah, I mean, that, that wasn't that, I'm, I'm going to say that, 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 point. that in 1990, there were zero cell phones in India. Mm. Today, there are over a billion cell phones. Guess, just imagine the power a woman gets by getting her own cell phone. Now, virtually every Indian woman is going to have a cell phone. And at the same time, As her own other, her own yeah. identity which she didn't have before. So there have been leaps in, in you know, relative, you look at where India was sure. decade by decade. It's quite amazing, the social transformation of sure, India. Sure, but you cannot put India in the same pack package as Singapore and, and China, oh, etc. No. It's very, very different okay. worlds. It will get there. Yeah. Carolina, um, President Trump visited Warsaw. Uh, he had no words of criticism of any kind for Kaczynski or the Law and Justice Party. Um, and he spoke words to the effect of the defense of the West being the great mission of the 21st century. Um, do you think the fact that we now have an American president who seems to be more drawn to dictators, be they Duterte, uh, Putin, uh, the House of Saud, uh, the fact that we have an American president who, um, who constantly undermines or seems to seek to undermine NATO, 
the European Union. Um, how does that feel being in Poland? You're right next to Russia. Uh, doesn't that change the world when the American president no longer uh, embodies uh, uh, the American commitment to the spread of freedom, democracy, rule of law, open markets, free trade, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah. Well, it certainly uh, Is this a new changes. world? It, it certainly changes. Trump's world. Uh, yes, it, it is certainly a new world, but I would also, um, um, I would avoid um, this uh, catastrophic gradualism. You know, there was this wonderful uh, essay. Catastrophic gradualism. Yes, this, well, there was this wonderful essay by George Orwell who wrote about the theory of catastrophic gradualism. We, what, is, what does it mean? It means that we believe that dictatorship, um, Trumps and Kaczynskis of this world, they're unavoidable, uh, unavoidable, and we just have to wait until this ends. And then um, we also mustn't believe that someone good comes of this all, yes? And um, I, would, I would certainly avoid this kind of thinking because it's as if we are saying, so um, US is already a, a US of, of Trump. Um, Poland is already a populist country of Jaroslav Kaczynski, full stop. And, um, and uh, Hungary is already Viktor Orbán's, when in fact Europe will be Chinese uh, soon. Um, but um, I think we have said enough about the, uh, the, the responsibility of liberal elites. We already know what the liberal elites did wrong. The discussion about it in Poland was very harsh and I think very fruitful. We know a lot of the, about the populists. Um, we, we understand how they work and it's really not, um, it's to, to Monica, it's, it's really not only, it's not about reducing everything to entertainment, it's about not neglecting that this is one sure. of important factors. Sure. So, so we do understand populists, we do know how they work and they, we do know what liberal democracies um, where they have flaws. And I think it's, it's really time to move on. I mean, Cultura Liberalna. Move on um, to where? Cultura Liberalna that I co-create in Warsaw, what we try to do is to reinvent liberalism and liberal ideas because we believe that ideas change politics. And what are eventually. the key components of that, of these new liberal ideas? So basically, um, we understand already that liberal Democrats in Poland will not go out of this crisis unchanged. And this is very important because for three years, uh, many liberal Democrats, the, the defenders of the, of, the, of the liberal democracy, would say, we would like the, the state as if it was before 2015. Well, the new generation doesn't want this. The new generation would like to prevail, would like to, to, to have the social economic reforms that were implemented by the law and justice. So this is the first point. We have to think about economy differently, not as we thought in the 90s and 2000s. We also have to understand that there is no contradiction between patriotic feelings and Europeanism. So this is the second thing. And the third thing, I, I, I think, so is trust. So a strong national identity is, is important and that should be recognized. It should be. We it shouldn't is, dream about it is a dissolution of nations. It is important. Nobody yeah. does. It should yeah. be recognized and it doesn't contradict yeah. strong European feelings. So, so the, these are... It's possible to have two ideas in your head? So, they are not contradictory. No, um, I, 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 I believe in Polish history, for example, yeah. there are strong examples of, uh, of our democratic engagement as early as the 15th century, where Poland, where, when Poland was uh, a multi-ethnic country with religious tolerance. So yeah. it's, it's, it's possible to be at the same time proud of one's country and its history and European, European in the meaning of, sure. of respecting European values. And this is something very important to say, not only in my country, but I believe also sure. in Central Europe. The last point is about trust. Um, someone asked me today what the rule of law is, and I responded with 
with a sentence that basically rule of law is not only um, um, respecting the constitution, the judges, the Supreme Court, etc., but also it's about respecting the habits. So the, the worst thing that was done by the law and justice government was that the trust to the rule of law was um, deteriorated, destroyed, yeah. because um, people are people do not know what to expect next. So these three things, I believe. Economy, identity, and trust. Can, can I yeah, sure come back I... just, I, I was last weekend in, in Oxford where we had the, the 35 years of the Reuters Institute and so many fellows came from all over the world. One of them was uh, from the Philippines in Asia and uh, she is a journalist who created Rappler. Her name is Maria R Ressa. She's and, amazing. And she's amazing. And she, she has resisted since more than one year to the worst attacks on her that you can imagine. Because we didn't speak of social media. We speak of media, but not of social media. Social media can be used to destroy someone and to destroy um, operations and, and, and uh, put in doubt everything you write. And uh, um, they even invented for her uh, the name uh, prostitution. So she was, of mm. course, uh, uh, threatened of rape, of death, of everything every day. But the prostitution was the, the word that was always used to speak of her website, etc., etc. So if in the Philippines uh, a, a dictator in a few years has succeeded already in killing four journalists just last year, four journalists killed in the Philippines, which, is the mo which makes up the Philippines the most dangerous country uh, in Asia for journalists, um, etc. So how can you say, you know, it's a period we, we, we have to, to understand with the populists, we have to, un you know, I mean, there are countries where uh, you can go very fast to fascism mm -hmm. and to um, the worst forms of, uh, demolition of individuals, etc., mm -hmm. and the media. So I think, once again, I'm amazed by the resistance of the US uh, against Trump. I think it's absolutely fantastic. I'm not sure the same would happen in France or in the UK, where I live since 20 years. I don't see that as lively as that. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I wanted to, to say it. But I think it's a very serious you, matter that uh, democracy is in danger in many, many places. Yes, but I'm talking about a certain kind of determinist thinking that I, uh, I personally oppose. Um, to say that, that um, it, is, it is decided, so to say, that, that Poland is now um, a, a country running towards dictatorship, or the US or Hungary, uh, and, and that it will prevail, is to demobilize people who are active in those countries. As a fundraiser for my um, organization, I often hear from the sponsors, potential sponsors in the West, we will not sponsor you anymore because it's senseless. You're hopeless. You, you mean just, it's, o it's over? It's just, you just lost your chance. And then, then I say, how will you say it to those people in Poland that organize the black protests, for example, those wonderful women who, uh, who, who organized the, the, the black protests against the, against the restriction of abortion law, and you all saw the photos in the media. And what will you say? Will you say that to the students that were the first ones to invent those beautiful protests in defense of the rule of law with candles? You surely remember that because you saw it in the New York Times. Yeah. Um, so, so it's very important to understand that we are going through a very deep crisis but um, to quote one more philosopher tonight, because we have been quoting Socrates and Confucius, and I would like to quote a Polish philosopher whose name was Henrik Elsenberg. And he said, intellectuals often think that pessimism is wiser than optimism. <laughs> and I, it's, this is a mistake. You I'm have to think pessimistically, but act optimistically. Uh, I'm going to throw this open to some questions in a few minutes, so um, if you'd like to think about any question you may wish to ask. 
Uh, Monique, do you think the, the great, you mentioned women in India, do you think the great and most significant revolution of the 21st century is going to be the empowerment of women? I don't know if it will be a revolution, but I know that... You don't think the Me Too movement is a revolution? I think the Me Too movement is very important, and, and, and just because so many men told me I had no idea that this is what happens to young girls and to less young girls uh, every day in their life, and that they have to think of it all the time, I think this was extremely important. I'm very afraid of the backlash that it, it will provoke, as it, it, it always does. Uh, and, and, and bon. But on this question of empowerment of women, do you know in how many countries in the world women have the same rights constitutionally and legally than men? How many countries? Fifteen. One five. So, so we live in a small island where women have the same rights uh, legally and constitutionally, that is to say they can open a but, I mean, bank account. Hang on, hang on a second, there are 28 countries in the European Union. Yes. And? Yes, but there are many differences and this is a, a big study. You mean study you can that be in the European Union yeah. and women legally and constitutionally do not for, have the for, same rights? For the inheritance or for many different things. And this is a, a big report by the World Bank and it's fascinating to read, I swear. Mm -hmm. um, but so we are not yet there. But it's true that the day women will be really empowered, things will change because they bring a different view. Because we have seen it in journalism. The fact that suddenly you had so many war reporters who were women and girls changed completely the way we reported wars. Uh, before it was very much about the arms, about the tanks, about you know everything, and now it's always the human angle. And I really think, because I've lived it and I've seen it, that it's the, 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 the big thing that women have, have brought to journalism. But if you apply that to big corporations, uh, where when they are in management, things don't happen exactly the same, uh, and, and everywhere, yes, it will be a revolution the day they have the same rights, but uh, not in you know saying stop the men and you know Christine Lagarde to speak of her uh, because you mentioned the M uh, MFI, IMF. IMF. Uh, sorry, because in French yeah. it's different. Um, said uh, once that if she had to put as many women as men at the IMF. Uh, it would mean that for 20 years she would never appoint a, a man, man, which would be totally unjust and, and totally unbearable. So you have everything has to happen in their own uh, time. But yeah. the fact that we are conscious of it is very important. By the way, she also very bravely said that the day is coming under the IMF constitution. The headquarters of the IMF must always be in the capital of the biggest economy in the world. When China becomes the biggest economy in the world in the next 10 years, it IMF will, will have to move. That leads to my, uh, my, my the last question uh, before I throw it open. Uh, just talk us through China and the United States in the 21st century. Two models, mm. uh, two most powerful countries on the face of the earth. Um, it's the critical relationship. Um, mm. It's always seemed to me it's so symbiotic and China's desire for stability mm. at least until 2050 is so strong in order to develop that ways will be found to get around mm. tensions. Uh, right now, tensions are fairly high. Mm. Um, which model is going to be stronger? How is it going to play out? Well, actually, my goal this year, Roger, is to write a book on U.S.-China relations and spending the okay, whole well, year... Okay, give us a taste, a brief I, taste. I, I, I'll tell you very briefly that it is going to be the biggest game in town, by far, the U.S.-China relationship. All your lives, all our lives are going to be affected by this. Don't, wherever you are in the world, you'll be affected by the, the two dragons shaking the boat. And it will be a very complex game because it's an economic game, a political game, a military game, a cultural game, and also what I call the game for who's number one, mm -hmm. right? And each dimension, by the way, let's take, take, for example, the economic dimension. It was assumed that an economy like China would get some kind of crash landing and could never take off. Now, frankly, the Chinese economy could very well take off and by 2050 may have a GNP almost twice that well, of the United States. it has taken off already. No, it has taken off, but it has not yet 
become bigger than the United States. When it becomes bigger than the United States, that's a really, really big deal. And the, the, the consequences on that, for example, we all use the US dollar as the reserve currency, and we take it as natural, the US dollar as a reserve currency. What happens when the, reserve, when the US dollar is the reserve currency, is the currency of the second most economic power and not the number one economic power? There's are consequences that flow. On the political side, the Chinese political system is not supposed to succeed. It is supposed to fail because China is going to have, by far, the world's largest middle class. Middle classes want more say. Therefore, the Chinese Communist Party is supposed to be history. And it'll be quite astonishing, and I suspect we're not psychologically ready for this, that we may actually have a very intelligent, meritocratic, competent Communist Party that changes and adapts and survives and becomes stronger. So that's a possibility that we want, want to think about, but that's a reality. And then on the military side, the, as you know, the United States has vessels flying, flying 12 miles off China's shores. There are no Chinese naval vessels 12 miles off Californian shores for a start. But if the US continues to have naval vessels 12 miles, you will have Chinese naval vessels. So that's a game that can be prevented, by the way. And then on the cultural side, this is, this is the big change that's going to come in, is that the chemistry of the world, the cultural chemistry of the world is going to change. And it's not going to be, by the way, uh, a monolingual uh, cultural lens, because I can, one of the most stunning facts about China that so few people know is that China is now producing the largest number of Western classical musicians in the world. Indeed. And it's, uh, some, the number is somewhere between 50 to 100 yeah. million new pianists, violinists, cellists, and so on and so forth. The largest... 100 million? Yes, 100 million. It's, a, it's shocking, isn't it, Roger? <laughs> isn't it shocking? And by the way, Roger, that, the, the that's biggest... That's a lot of music. <laughs> I know. The, the biggest... <laughs> The biggest new concert houses, the biggest new opera houses are uh, yeah. being built in, them in China. So, that, that, therefore, it's not just so a what, pure... So, what's your point? No, that, my that point, my, 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 my point is that it is not a zero-sum game. And that if both sides... The goal of my book is to assure both sides that it doesn't have to be a zero-sum game, that we live together in one small, fragile, interdependent Earth. We've got to take care of climate change first. And if you can persuade China and America that climate change is our number one priority, then the zero-sum games that can be reduced in the interest of trying to only protect the only planet that we have. Thank you, Kisho. Now, I'd like to, is there a mic um, somewhere? Does anyone have a, I see a question at the back there. Um, and then the lady here, Angie here, um, yes. Yes, sir, go ahead. Fen Hampson from Canada. Terrific uh, discussion uh, led by a very uh, provocative uh, moderator. Uh, my question is a simple one. Uh, if you were to rank the threats to democracy, is it growing social inequality? Is it bad leaders, populist leaders? Is it technology? Or is it external threats and other models, China, Russia? I'd like to ask the panel, if you were to rank those threats, what is the greatest threat? Because during the course of the day, we've, I've been making a list. And to be sure, they're interrelated. But from a policy perspective, what is the main problem we should be focusing on? Okay, so look, no fudging. Uh, we were asked to say which is the greatest threat, so we're gonna start with you, Carolina, and go along. No fudging, just say which of those that were mentioned is the greatest threat and why. I would say bad leaders, if I were to, uh, to, f to, to, to choose from, from this, because as far as I observe in my own, own country, what we are observing is, in my deep belief, not the, not the beginning of something, but rather the end of something. Namely, it is the end. It is the, 
a certain degeneration of a, a dissident ethos. As you know, the Polish politics have been created by ex-dissidents, and the Third Republic is their wonderful achievement. But with time, they have become radicalized, um, uncompromised, and they more hate each other than they seek for uh, a common state. And this is, I think, the source, at least in the local perspective, the first source of our problems. Okay, Keisha, thank you. In, in one word, my one word answer will be complacency. And what do I mean by complacency? Everybody's been quoting Winston Churchill's statement, democracy is the worst form of government except the alternative, and everyone focuses on except the alternative, but doesn't focus on part one, which is democracy is the worst form of government. And why is that so? Because democracies are basically like angry dragons. You have to manage them every day. You can't assume that democracies will produce good results automatically, as we have seen. And therefore, the culture of complacency, the belief that once you have a democracy, you have arrived. And we've seen countries that became democracies arrived and went back, as we saw recently. So I think it's very important to give up what I call the culture of worship of democracy. It's not a god, it's a challenge. And in any country, a democratic political system is a challenge. And you know, we spoke earlier of uh, Myanmar and Aung San Suu Kyi. One factor you should bear in mind is that Aung San Suu Kyi has no control of the military. The military was very keen that she come out and say and defend the Rohingya, then she would have been political toast in Myanmar and the military would have won. So that's why, you, this won. is my point they about it. They have won anyway. Huh? They have won anyway. Uh, not, not, not yet. I mean, there's well, anyway, Let's, let's take to the question. Okay, uh, okay on to money. So for me, uh, the, the biggest threat is, would be certainly the more shutdown of the free press and the free media in the world. There are so many countries where this has already happened, and this is the start of uh, all, uh, you know, uh, horrors. So the shutdown of the free press seems to me uh, in so many countries and also of civil society and the NGOs, and you see that with, uh, in many countries where now, like India or Russia you can, or China, you cannot fund uh, NGOs with uh, uh, foreign uh, funding, yeah. etc. So both these two things are, for me, the biggest threat that we have in the world today. Interesting that none of you choose growing inequality or technology. Um, not technology. Sorry? Not technology. Why? Yeah. Um, yes, I think Angie, uh, you had a question there. In, yes, in the uh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Angie Hobbs from the UK. Would you mind standing up? Okay, just to, yeah. sorry. Angie Hobbs from the UK, Europe. Um, we've been talking about democracy as if it's part of a general package which goes along with human rights, the rule of law, freedom of expression. But it seems to me that one of the biggest challenges that supporters of democracy at the moment face is that we quite often have to choose between how much do we support democracy and how much do we support human rights or the rule of law or something. Because as we've been hearing uh, over the course of the last couple of days, one of the greatest threats probably the greatest threat to democracy comes from within in that democracies can vote themselves out of existence, particularly when votes are manipulated by misinformation and various rhetorical techniques. And when we see that happening, we kind of think, oh my goodness, do we just accept the way these democratic votes are going and let democracies die around us? Or do we think actually no, I'm going to support human rights and I'm, I'm going to express my unhappiness with a particular democratic vote. So I think we need to face the really tough challenge that democracy and human rights and the rule of law ideally go together in our heads. They don't always go together in practice. And right now we're having to choose sometimes and it's tough. Mm -hmm. What would you say about that, Kishore? Um, oh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, in the sense of the question away is, you know, if, if democracy is heading in the wrong direction, if we're in 1933 and 
Berlin or, yeah. you know, or, or perhaps 2018 in Washington. Uh, uh, you know, at what point when you see truth, um, what's true and what's false being blurred, the distinction disappearing, when you find yourself shrugging, when you hear yet another yeah. lie or misleading statement from the Oval Office, uh, when you see the very fabric of, of democracy uh, being corrupted, uh, then what do you do? Do you just, do you just wait it out or what? Well, I, 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 I have, as you know, a less dismal view of the world. I'm, I tend to be very optimistic and... I don't have a dismal view of the world. You keep saying this. <laughs> <laughs> and I no, no, no. I mean, you, 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 <laughs> met, you, see, mention, you mentioned, a, you mentioned I, 1933. I, I and and we are in 2018. I plan to enjoy the world for as long as I'm in it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, no, but it's, 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 seriously, seriously. You know, it is the, the large fact that you know, I can say this. I, I grew up in a typical developing country. The per capita income was Singapore in 1965, when Singapore became independent, $500 the same as Ghana. And I came from a very poor family in a very poor society. So I, I've seen the transformation of societies that have gone from being very poor to being very successful and providing opportunities for their people. Now, the good news on the human rights front, for example, is that, again, if you look in terms of the deprivation of human rights that vast masses of human beings suffered, it was often simple things like hunger, uh, starvation, arbitrary rules, uh, subject to feudal serfs, and so on and so forth. Here, the liberation of the ordinary human being from many of these constraints that would, in a sense, define yeah, their life. in the United States of America, you have 3,000 children being torn away from their parents and stuck into yeah. camps of one kind and, or another. And, I mean, and, and, there's and, something and, going and, on. And, and, I, don't mean, I don't mean to be pessimistic. But yeah, <laughs> I, yeah and, I, and I think we have to fight in those areas, yeah. but I'm saying that in the general direction that the world is headed in, and if you look in terms of the, just, just the one indicator, the number of people who've gone to university and had a university education, and therefore their sense of what rights they are entitled to is much larger than what you had in the past. So the broad trend is a positive one, even though you will have back, uh, uh, back steps, yeah. stepping back in some areas. So I said, let, let the large, focus also on the larger picture and not just on the exceptions. I must concede to Keisha that every time I go to Asia, I do feel a surge of optimism. So, Me too. Yeah, uh, there is something in the air. Um, I think Farah had a, a question. Um, you and by the way, Angie, I, it was interesting to hear you say uh, you're from the UK, Europe. You can say that for another six months, right? <laughs> 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 or, or maybe, hopefully not. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, Oh, sorry. Uh, from the, okay, get, uh, can you just wait a minute? The ambassador just had a question, and then I'll come right back to you. Thanks, Roger. Just really quickly, okay. um, one word I haven't heard people utter, and especially since we're in Athens, is alliances. And I think it'd be interesting to hear everybody speak on this, especially in the context of the, the West versus China question. But certainly one of America's great strengths is our alliance relationships, all of which are entered into voluntarily, and all of which, at least for the past 30 years, have been firmly grounded in our shared democracy. And that's true both here in Europe, but also in Asia, Latin America. I think, I think um, Carolina, I mean, uh, Poland, for Poland, obviously, the alliance with the United States is absolutely fundamental. And, and clearly, we have a president now who's, whose view of the alliance seems to be more of a zero-sum game than that we can grow together and prosper together. So, so how, how, how important does, it, does the alliance remain for Poland and how is it experienced today in, in, in Poland, which is really, if you like, a, a frontline state? The answer is complicated because first it, it is connected with uh, a certain change in the, in the uh, Polish foreign policy after 2015. The idea of the law and justice government is that instead of being one of the 28 countries of the European Union, we are another American state. Um, so this is something else than, than an alliance. It's rather, what I'm observing is rather um, the consequence of 
a country isolating itself in the European Union, working contradictory to the policies that brought us the best partners in Europe, and then uh, when it seems quite hopeless and we, we are completely isolated in Europe, then pointing at the US that we will be at least the best ally for the US. Um, this is very worrying because um, I don't think, again, I don't think this is contradictory. When a country can and should be a good ally with the US and at the same time a well integrated country and in the how European Union. can you rely on Trump? Yeah. Well, I and think, also, yeah, yeah, I mean, uh, I think when America's word um, is doubted, then yeah. the system we've lived since 1945 begins to unravel. And uh, anyway, it's not my role to speak about that tonight. Mm -hmm. uh, I, uh, and last question from Farah, please. Yeah. Um, Farah Nayiri, uh, I'm a writer for the New York Times. I, before I ask my question, um, I wanted to confirm what Kishore said because last week um, Simon Rattle was speaking in London and he said that there were more people learning piano in China than the entire population of Germany. So um, mm. and that's from a great conductor, so I think he knows what he's talking about. Um, the question I had for, from Kishore is um, the reason, one of the chief reasons why liberal democracy is sort of the dominant um, political system, at least in the Western world, is to do with the dominance of, of the US economy. The US economy is the world's great superpower and has been for, you know, for, for you know, many decades. Um, and I just wonder what you're saying about China becoming the next superpower and, and super, you know, exceeding, you know, the GDP of America, et cetera. What is that going to mean uh, for the future of liberal democracy? I mean, do we look forward to a future where the Chinese political model will be imposed on the world? Well, I, I, I actually I can give a very clear and simple answer that the Chinese political model will not become a role model uh, for the world. And I think even, by the way, <laughs> even within China, there, are, to, there is constant... Back to the beginning here. <laughs> yeah, there's constant questioning about where they're going to go in the future. But it's also important to understand that the future of democracy does not depend entirely on, on the United States. For example, take India, for example, which is going to become the most popular state in the world by 2050. You'll have a larger population than China. There's nothing you can do to reverse uh, democracy in India. It's so deeply embedded and it's part of the culture, part of the DNA and so on and so forth. And so if, if a country like Indonesia, for example, and, and I, I'm, I'm really sorry that so few people are paying attention to Indonesia because it's the world's most populous Islamic country. And if in the Islamic world, you can create a genuinely successful, uh, pluralistic uh, democracy in Indonesia, then that actually can become a, a kind of a shining star uh, for the Muslim world. So there, is, there are pieces of good news. And, and in also, uh, it's also important to understand the global middle class population, you must have this statistic in your brain, is going to go from 1.8 billion in 2010 to 3.2 billion in 2020 to 4.9 billion in 2030, which means more than half the world's population by 2030 will enjoy middle class living standards. Now, middle class says, clearly one greater political participation. It's just a natural correlation. So I see, in a sense, a big, I'm very surprised by the tone of this conference because I see democracy as a sunrise industry in the world and not as a sunset industry. What a great note to end yeah, on. I'm also going to surprise Kishore by ending on an optimistic note. And, <laughs> and just remind, we are in Greece, and Greece has been, in recent years, through uh, outside wartime, the most uh, severe, uh, economic downturn uh, that any nation has known in a long time. And I remember being here when Golden Dawn, uh, far-right party, was ascendant, and there was a lot of talk about Golden Dawn possibly entering the government here, and whether Greek democracy would hold. And the problems have not gone away, but I think uh, the crisis has eased. Uh, Greece has come through. Uh, in the midst of the crisis, I was in Lesbos, where small boats were arriving from Turkey, and I was struck by the generosity, kindness of the Greek people. And uh, I think this country, this nation, has an optimistic 
story to tell about the resilience of democracy. Thank you all very much. Thank you. You're very, you're very good. Thank you. Thank you.